will start us with a prayer and then uh, we'll go from there. O Heavenly King, the comfort of the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Amen. Okay, so, um, yeah, Moses is going to be coming up uh, sooner than anybody might think, uh, meaning next time, uh, because we're really, um, last uh, last Bible study, the one that, as Michael mentioned, we live streamed from the Parish Life Conference, uh, was really sort of the culmination sort of of the narrative arc of Abraham's story. Um, what we have left that we're going to go through tonight are a few bits and pieces about the end of his life. Um, and so uh, hypothetically, I could say that this might be a slightly shorter Bible study, but every time I say that I'm wrong. Um, also, if it does, because we have sort of a more limited amount of material uh, that we're going through and talking about. If it is a little shorter in that respect, I'm always open to uh, just filling that out with some more questions about what we talk about tonight or anything having to do with Abraham or, you know, anything in general um, other than, I don't know, college baseball. Like, I don't really know anything about college baseball, but um, other than that, we can kind of, kind of do AMA if we have uh, some extra time. Uh, so sort of the culmination of the culmination last time was talking about uh, the uh, sacrifice of Isaac. And um, I'm not going to go through all that again, obviously. And since we're coming to the end of Abraham's life, I'm not going to sort of summarize Abraham's whole life now before, uh, before we hear talk about the end of it. But um, a lot of the themes that we saw a lot of the struggles that Abraham faced, the things that he frankly struggled with God about uh, back and forth. We saw how those found a kind of resolution uh, in um, his willingness to, to sacrifice Isaac. Um, and we're gonna see sort of tonight in these last few episodes um, at the end of, of Abraham's life, we're going to see sort of the payoffs of a few, a few more of those, um, some little bits and pieces uh, that we're going to pick up. But so uh, we will start there. And then next time, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be flipping over to uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, the life of Moses. Um, Format wise, um, so with with the life of King David that we did first, that's kind of a contiguous chunk of scripture, right? We started sort of part way through First Samuel, where David first appears and went through to his death, and that was sort of one straight shot through the rest of First Samuel, and then Second uh, Samuel or First Kingdoms and Second Kingdoms in the Orthodox Study Bible. Um, with Abraham, obviously, we've been in Genesis. We've been going pretty much straight through. Tonight, we're going to skip a little bit um, because there are some little bits and pieces. Um, the main thing that we're going to skip is uh, really most of the story of Isaac is sort of in the middle of what we're going to read tonight. And at some point in the future, when we get to year eight or nine, um, or 10 of this Bible study. Um, I'm sure we'll be looping back around to go to different figures and eventually we'll get to Isaac, but we'll talk about Isaac there. Uh, so we're gonna be focusing on um, Abraham and Sarah and the end of their lives tonight. Uh, with Moses, when we get there, uh, I'm saying this mainly not to worry people. Um, we're not gonna go through like the whole rest of the the whole rest of the Torah from Exodus one, all the way through the end of Deuteronomy. Um, we're going to, we're going to start out going pretty much straight through an Exodus. And then we're going to, we're going to do some, some skipping around. So you're, you're, um, because we're, we're focusing on the life of Moses. So we're not necessarily going to talk about uh, as exciting and interesting. It is why you can't boil a calf in its mother's milk. We're not going to, we're not going to get into the whole, 
all of that, at least at this point. Again, maybe year 12 or 13 of this Bible study, we'll come back around and talk about that kind of stuff. But um, we're really focusing on the life. So sometimes, like tonight, like eventually in the latter part of Moses's life, uh, that means skipping a little bit um, to focus on sort of the narrative parts uh, describing your life. Um, so all that said, in terms of what we're doing and, and uh, where we're going. Um, so I believe we technically left off in the last Bible study um, a little shy of the end of chapter 22. Uh, so um, I'll go ahead and, and read these verses, though I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on them. Uh, so we'll pick up in uh, Genesis chapter 22, uh, verse 20. Now it came to pass after these things, uh, after these things is sort of the equivalent of my, my grandfather would say the other day, and the other day could be anything except today. The other day could be yesterday. The other day could be a month ago, a year ago, 10 years ago. So after these things sort of functions the same way in, uh, in the Old Testament. After these things could mean right after they got back from Mount Horeb. After these things could mean 12 years later. Right? Um, so it doesn't specify. Um, and uh, there's actually in the, in the original Hebrew here, there's actually a disjunction. Right, so we know that there's some amount of time skipped here. We don't know exactly how much. Uh, when we get to the beginning of chapter 23, we're going to see that by the beginning of chapter 23, a significant amount of time has passed. Um, so um, where exactly this is is in between is kind of open, but it's not totally crucial. But just to point out that after these things is just means gap of time of indeterminate length. Came to pass after these things, it was told Abraham saying, indeed, Milcah also has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hatzo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Reuma, also bore Teba, Gaham, Dahash, and Ma'aka. Um, none of these are super popular biblical names, I've noticed, um, for people to give their children. Um, this, uh, these, these names, mainly uh, verse 21 is usually the verse, people may have noticed this, when I refer to an obscure verse of the Bible that doesn't have any obvious application, that's the verse I refer to is uh, Genesis 22, uh, verse 21, which is uh, literally Uz was the brother of Buzz. Um, so, um, but the point here is this is establishing something uh, for something later in the narrative. Because uh, you notice the the lead up here is to Rebecca, right? This Rebecca is the granddaughter of Abraham's brother, and so at some point in the future, not tonight, when we get when we talk about the story of Isaac finding and meeting his wife Rebecca, this is telling us where Rebecca came from. So I don't know exactly how the math works. If anybody wants to shoot up a hand or say in the chat, because they do know. Um, I don't know if this makes Rebecca Isaac's second cousin. Um, but uh, it's not first cousin, because first cousin would be, uh, her father would be Isaac's first cousin. Um, but uh, it's going to become important in the Isaac story that uh, Abraham doesn't want Isaac to marry a Canaanite. And so he goes back and marries a Mesopotamian um, from sort of their own broader 
broader clan. Okay. So now chapter 23. Now, Sarah lived 127 years. This is why I say uh, there's a fairly sizable time gap here, because we were told when Isaac was born, she was 90. Uh, so now that we're at the end of Sarah's life, Isaac would now be 37-ish, depending on what his birthday is, right? But about 37 years old. So a significant amount of time has passed. Um, verse 2, then Sarah died in the city of Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Okay. Um, where it says that is Hebron, this is one of the places I mentioned way back when, when we were starting uh, in the story of Abraham, when I talked about, uh, while well, we hold that what we have in the Torah originated with uh, Moses, that there are sort of notes and updates and editorial notes and things in there from a later from a later period. This would be one of those. So Kiriath Arba was sort of the ancient name of the ancient Canaanite name of the place, and then Hebron obviously is what it comes to be called uh, later in the history of Israel, right? And so someone later on has sort of put this note. That's why um, that's the way that the Orthodox study Bible here understands it. Also, that's why they put it in parentheses that someone has come along later and added this note because at this later time when it's being read by Israelites, they don't know, they've never heard of Kiriath Arba. They know it as Hebron, right? So it's to catch them up. Um, so Abraham mourns and weeps for her. Then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Het, saying, I am a sojourner and a stranger among you. Give me, therefore, a burial place among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So you may have noticed there this sort of interesting phrasing where uh, he's referring to uh, Sarah as my dead. That's that's strikes us weird, strikes us weird in English. And this is part of uh and probably the origination of uh a per meaning here at here in the uh Greek translation of the Pentateuch, here the Greek translation of Genesis is the origin of. The particular use of the Greek word uh, necros, um, which is usually just translated dead, dead person, dead body, right? Um, but here it has attached to it um, mu, right? My dead, um, which among other things, that uh, possessive pronoun. Uh, makes it definite um, when i say makes it definite it's like adding the definite article right so in english we have an indefinite article a or n right so you have a dog right an apple um, and we have a definite article uh the dog the apple right um in in Greek, it's a little more complicated than that. So ancient Greek, like archaic Greek, had no article at all. Latin has no article at all. Uh, so they were like in that way originally. Um, and what happens is uh, at a certain point, and it's really in between about the third century BC, which is about when uh, the Pentateuch is being translated um, into uh, Greek uh, and the first century, which is when the New Testament is being written. In that period, uh, what we now call the Greek article that gets translated as the usually, uh, that 
word in Greek, which was originally what's called a demonstrative pronoun. It originally meant this. That starts to get used as an article. So what do I mean by that? Originally, you would say in Greek, a man, or you would say this man, right? This man being a particular man. We would say a dog or the dog in English. But with, with Greek, you have man or this man. <laughs> to, to mean a particular one. Um, and uh, much later on in Greek, like in modern Greek, they use is, which means one, uh, as an indefinite article. So now you would say one man or the man, <laughs> right? And one man means like just any man, a man. Uh, but so in this case, the my is serving to make it make it definite. Why am I making such a big deal out of this? Um, I'm making a big deal out of this because St. Paul makes a big deal out of this. So in, in St. Paul, he is very careful. Sometimes he has dead, uh, necros or necri, the plural, with no article, no sort of the in front of it, right? And when he, when he does that, He's referring to just dead people in general. Right. When he uses the article, when he refers to the dead with, with the article, uh, honokros or enikri, uh, he means specifically dead Christians, like these dead, like he's referring to to Christians who have passed away, Christians who have fallen asleep, right? They are, they have the definite article to, to distinguish them. And this is an important distinction in St. Paul when you're reading him to understand what he's saying. Because sometimes, you know, he'll talk about the resurrection of, of all who are dead, right? That at, when Christ returns, all who have died will be raised from the graves, right? Um, but he will also sometimes apply things only to the dead in Christ, which is a phrase he uses once, but implies a lot. Um, so those are two different things. This is also important with our hymnography at Pascha. Um, sometimes people hear some of our hymnography at Pascha and based on not understanding this distinction, um, they, uh, they come to sort of universalist conclusions. They say, oh, well, these hymns are, make it sound like everyone's going to be saved. But if you understand this distinction, and if you look at the hymns in the original Greek and see where the article is and where the definite article isn't, um, it becomes more, more clear what's being said. So Abraham uh, referring to uh, Sarah as my dead, uh, as still definite, right, means that he sees her as still connected to him. The two of them are still connected. We're going to see more of this develop through what we read tonight. This is going to be one of the major things that's going to develop in what we reread tonight is. This is Genesis. This is the first book of the Bible, right? The story of Abraham is the first story, really, after Genesis 1 through 11, right? So we get, we get Adam and Eve, we get the flood, we get the Tower of Babel, but then Abraham is sort of the first person we follow. So this is sort of our earliest layer of the understanding of death. Uh, by by Abraham and then by God's people in general. And so, um, excuse me. Um, so we're going to see that kind of unfold here, but this is this is the beginning of that, right? So my dad means Abraham does not believe that she's now gone. She's disappeared, right? It's over. 
her body's going to rot, right? I mean, we can tell that already because he's asking for a place to bury her. So he still considers her body to be important. Right? Um, but um, this also, again, my dad is talking about her, right? That she still exists, right? She is not just gone. She has not ceased to exist. She has not gone off to some unrecoverable place where he will never see her again. Um, so this this reflects a very particular view of of death by Abraham, and now he's going to um, to bury the body. It's also worth noting because we did we did start with Genesis. We very much have in our head uh, an idea of what a human is. It comes more from Plato than it does from Christianity. Um, and uh, that's not a good thing. And I'm not saying Plato's horrible and evil and rotten. I'm just saying he's a pagan. He said some good things. He said a lot of bad things. And um, part of a big part of what Plato got wrong is this idea that the soul is a thing uh, that it's a thing separate from the body, that your actual self is this soul, that your body is like a prison that it's trapped in, and that the goal is to be freed from a physical body, right? This is why when St. Paul in Acts 17 was preaching in Athens, they, they were all intrigued uh, by what he had to say right up until he started talking about the bodily resurrection. And then they all, eh, what are you talking, right? That made no sense to them. Why would you want to be in the body again, right? So the, the, the body is this husk that gets shoved off. Now, obviously, Abraham doesn't believe that or he wouldn't be wanting to bury and care for Sarah's body this way. But also, the view that scripture actually gives is that who you are is a body that's enlivened by a soul. The word nefesh in Hebrew literally means uh life so when god in the days of creation creates uh the birds of the air and the fish of the sea it literally says the the souls that swim in the water and fly in the air right so that is that the light your your soul is not this thing that's inside your body trapped or otherwise or folded into it or overlaps with it or it's like a force ghost right that's sort of roughly shaped like your body uh but bright blue for some reason um it's uh that that your body is you you are your body and right your soul is the life of your body it's what makes your body alive and this just makes sense i mean if you look at a human or an animal or even a plant uh you you see it and it's alive right that person or that animal or that that plant and then you see it when it's dead and what is the difference materially it's identical materially nothing has changed but the life is gone from it it's no longer alive right and so the question then becomes where does that life go and does it ever come back to the body right but for for Abraham, this is this is more akin to the view Abraham has, and so his dead. This is still his wife Sarah, who he's now who he's now going to care for. And remember that one of the problems we saw as we went through the story of the life of Abraham was one of the things that Abraham had kind of failed at in the past was sort of protecting his wife, right? He was more concerned. Twice he went and lied about who she was because he didn't trust God and was worried something was going to happen to him. So it would murder him to take her as a wife. Um, and so he chose to protect himself rather than protecting her, right? Um, and, and several other similar things related to his role as a husband. But notice now, after this sort of transformational experience at Horeb, um, he, uh, 
he now has a different approach. Now he is in a different place. Now, even in death, he's going to he's going to care for her and uh, give her the burial he feels she deserves. Uh, notice here as he addresses sort of the locals, right? Uh, how he defines himself. Right now, he be, he's been told by God repeatedly that this land is being given to him, but he doesn't come in and say, "Hey, I'm the I'm the new owner of this place. Um, shove off, give me some room so I can so I can bury my wife." Um, he comes and says, "Look, I'm a stranger. I'm a sojourner," which he is. Right? He's he's living nomadically uh, at this point, um, and so he sort of humbly right asks them. Ask them for a place. Verse five, so the sons of Het answered Abraham saying, hear us, my Lord, you are a king from God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold his burial place from you to bury your dead there. So that seems kind of an extreme response, right? He approaches very humbly and says, look, I'm just a wandering nomad, right? Please, will any of you, you know, give me a place to, to, to bury my wife? And their response is to say that he is a king from God, right? Um, and uh, it's unclear. I mean, it's ambiguous in the, in, in the Hebrew even, whether they said, whether this is, because it says God, right? Elohim could be God, could be the gods, right? We, we don't know how pagan these folks are or aren't. But what this reflects, what this reflects is that since that major transformational event, uh, Abraham has been living in a way that reflects the character of his God. Abraham, through the experiences and the trials he's gone through, and through that one major culminating event, has become like God. And despite his humility, which is part of how he's become like God, um, other people can see that. Other people can see that. Now remember, earlier, Abimelech and his men said something similar but see there's been progress here before uh the the um, sacrifice of isaac they looked at him and said hey everywhere you go things seem to prosper right you seem to be you seem to be blessed by your god right so it was sort of a you seem blessed there's something about you we want to kind of get on board that train so that things will go well with us also. Um, but this is another level beyond that. Right? This is another level beyond that. Both that they see God reflected in him. And again, this identification is a king from God. Now, that's not totally unrelated. What I mean by that is that at this time in history, the kings were considered to be gods, right? Um, so uh, within a city-state like Ur, the one that Abram originally came from, uh, in this period, there was a king in each of these city-states, and the king was considered to be divine, right? That's what authorized his right to rule, Uh that was carried out through all kinds of uh, ritual practices, a lot of them very bad. Um, but uh, that also meant that the king of the city was sort of part of the pantheon or um, the gathering of the gods in general, right? So as we we tend to think of um, of uh, pagan religion as having these pantheons of gods, right? When we were kids, we learned about probably the first one we learned about was were the Greek gods, 
right? And we learned, oh, well, there's these 12 people who live, well, 12 gods who live on, on Mount Olympus and, and uh, this kind of thing. And they're kind of like the Justice League or whatever for the Avengers. Um, but uh, in reality, the, the way that worked, same thing with the Egyptian gods, is actually that each, each of these cities sort of had a god. And then as these cities were able to sort of extend their, their influence over other neighboring cities and make them vassals, sort of all of the gods of those other cities and areas were sort of incorporated, right? And were seen to relate to each other. So whatever city was on top. So at this period, this is the, the what's called the Ur three period, um, Ur in Sumer was the top, right? So their God was seen to be, right? The king of the gods, the other cities that it sort of influenced and controlled, their gods were sort of in the group, in the council. And then they had servants and spirits and there were demons and there were all manner of things, right? Um, but the, the king of the city was sort of part of that group. And so the king of the city, the, the, the functional reading reason for um, the king of the city being seen as divine, being seen as a god, was that he was then sort of the liaison between the gods and the people of the city. Right? So when there was some problem in the city that needed to be brought before the gods, it was the king who was supposed to do that. And when the gods had something they wanted done in the city, then the king was expected to do that, right? But he was sort of the go-between, right? That's how kingship worked at this time. So when these Canaanites say to Abraham, you are like a king from God among us, right? Um, they're not just talking about the fact that when they see Abraham and how he lives his life, and how he conducts himself, that it reflects who God is. But they're also saying that, that they can tell that, that he's the one sort of through whom, right, they would have access to God and who through whom God would speak to them. They see him as this kind of go-between. They see him as this kind of holy man, right, but with this sort of regal role right, the sort of fatherly role, even to them, who are pagan Canaanites, who aren't related to him. Obviously, Abraham was the head of, was the patriarch of his big extended family. But these are people who aren't related in any way, but they see in him and how he lives and in his relationship with God. They see that he has this connection um, to, the, to the divine, which they respect. And because of that, they say, if you need to bury your wife, right, any any place, none of us will deny you you any of our burial places. Uh, you can bury Sarah in any of them. Or seven, then Abraham stood and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. Thus he spoke with them, saying, if you have it in mind for me to bury my dead out of my sight, then listen to me and speak on my behalf to Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as a burial place among you. So given what they just said, right, they just said, hey, none of us will deny, take, take any, right, any cave, any burial place, anything you want, go ahead. Um, but Abraham, again, humbly says, no, look, if you want to help me, talk to this person. This is where I'd like to bury her and tell him I will pay full price, right? He's, he's not looking to take advantage of anybody or uh, exploit, again, humbly, even though they see that he has this relationship with God. He's not going to try to exploit the relationship he has with God to try to take something from them. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Het, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Het, and of all who entered at the gate of the city, saying, 
No, my Lord, hear me. I give you both the field and the cave within it. I give it to you in the presence of all my fellow citizens. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed himself before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you are for me, hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. So this is sort of anti-haggling, <laughs> right? Um, so first they say, you can have any cave you want. He says, well, I'll take this cave, but I want to pay full price for it. And Ephraim says, well, no, I'll give you the cave for free and the field it's in for free. And Abraham says, okay, I'll take the field and the cave, but I'm paying for it, right? So this is, this is anti-reverse haggling. Right, he's trying to pay more. Verse 14, Ephraim then answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 silver drachmas, but what is that between you and me? So bury your dead. So Abraham listened to Ephraim, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephraim, which he had mentioned in the hearing of the sons of Het, the 400 silver drachmas, currency of the merchants. So, so Ephron insists, like, no, look, this is how much the field costs, right? But that what what's what's that between you and me? Just take it, right? And so Abraham, we're told, listens to him, but then goes and pays him anyway, sort of against his will. Verse seventeen. Thus, the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was opposite Mamre. The field and the cave in it and all the trees in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as his possession in the presence of the sons of Het before all who entered the city. Well, see, we, we get the notice there that they're sitting at the entrance of the city. I know we talked about this before when we were going through the life of David. So in the ancient Near East, at this time and for centuries afterward, um, there weren't sort of standing law courts, right? They, they didn't have like a legal system like we do. Uh, they didn't have uh, sort of town council meetings that followed Robert's Rules of Order. Um, but the men of the city, the, the elders of the city, the older men of the city would go during the day and sit at the gates of the city. And so any issues between people that needed to be resolved or if contracts needed to be made or uh, like in this case, land transactions, uh, any, any kind of thing that we would normally do with courts or with a lawyer or with a notary, um, any of those kind of things were done this way. They would go to the gate of the city. They would go before the elders. If something needed to be decided, the, the elders of the people there would, would decide it. They'd speak together and decide it. If, um, if it was just a question of them being witnesses to something, like in this case, that's why it keeps mentioning this was said before everyone and everyone heard it, right? That, that there were the elders of the city were sort of there as witnesses, right, to the fact that this had taken place. Um, because, of course, we don't have like signatures, right? We don't have. Um, there's obviously, there's no way to do audio or video recording. The, the only thing you have is testimony, is, is human witnesses to things who can testify. No, I can testify this happened on this day, right? Um, this is what took place. Um, so verse 19, and then after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which was opposite Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So that field and the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Het as property for a burial place. Okay. So in a minute, we're going to be skipping uh, to chapter 25. Because as I mentioned, we're going to skip over the story of Isaac uh, for now. Um, because we're still focusing on uh, Abraham. But uh, something important to note before we make that jump. So you notice here, 
just how much detail is given about where exactly Sarah was buried, right? We're given this sort of very exact location. It's here, it's opposite Mamre, right? We're given all of these locators to give us sort of here in the text, the exact location. We have this later editor coming in and making the, the sort of comment in the parentheses, right? This is Hebron. Later on, this place was called Hebron. Um, to update it, to make sure that this location is clear. Um, there's only one reason why Genesis would do that. And that's because from some very early period, in the life of Israel, this was a place of pilgrimage, right? If there was not, the, if the idea of making a pilgrimage to the place where someone was buried didn't exist, why would you record the place in such detail 500 to 700 maybe 800 years after the fact, right? There, there is no good reason. There, there is no really good reason. Um, so this shows us, this shows us, and this is an important piece here, that that idea already, already existed the idea that people would go to the place where Sarah was. We already talked about this language where Abraham refers to her as my dead, right? That there's still this connection, that this is still Sarah, right? In, in some sense, right? Um, and now we can tell from the text that people are going there to be in the place where Sarah is even though she's departed, right? even though she's departed. Right? And this is important because there are folks out there who will come to us Orthodox Christians and uh, they aren't big fans of the idea of relics of the saints. They aren't big fans of the idea of taking pilgrimages to places where uh, saints relics are. They aren't real fans of going there and asking a saint to pray for you. Okay. But not only is this not something that came into Christianity at some point, this is something that predates Christianity. This is something that goes back to the beginning of ancient Israelite religion. I mean, this is even pre-Judaism, technically. Like, this, this isn't even Judaism yet. This is all the way back. And it's not that, well, this was in the past and then somehow Judaism lost it. This is found in Judaism. But more important for us, uh, because we aren't part of rabbinic Judaism, uh, is the fact that, for example, Christ talks about the tombs of the prophets that were decorated, right? that there were the tombs where the prophets were buried, that they were decorated. In his day, people went there on pilgrimages. They asked for the prayers of the prophets. People went to the burial place of Sarah, and we're going to see also here in, in a couple of minutes the burial place of, of Abraham. And these most of these places are still there to this day. Some of them were destroyed recently by ISIS. Um, but um, many of them are still there to this day. A lot of them are not all that accept, uh, accessible uh, because some of them are in uh, Palestine. And so uh, they've been made hard to get to. Um, but uh, uh, these were places of pilgrimage. There was still this connection. It's not just that Abraham still felt he had a connection to his wife, Sarah, after her death. It's that all of her descendants, all of the later people 
who who shared Abraham's faith still had a connection to her. So this idea that we now call sainthood, this idea that we now call the relics of the saints, this idea of pilgrimage, this idea of the intercession of the saints, this is nothing new with Christianity, let alone something that comes into Christianity in the Middle Ages or something like some folks, uh, some of our friends might want to might want to tell us, right? This is something that goes all the way back as beginning as you can get. This goes all the way back to Abraham. This goes back to Moses. This goes back to the very beginning, right, of, of the people of God, this, this uh, understanding. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and we'll skip a chapter and pick up at the beginning of uh, Genesis chapter 25, verse 1. Now Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah. So she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begot Sheba and Dedan. Thus the sons of Dedan were Raguel, Nabdid, and the Asherim the Ledushim and the Leumim. And the sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephor, Hanok, Abida, and Elda. All these were the sons of Keturah. Again, a long list of not super popular biblical names. No one has ever asked me to baptize a Nabdeed or a Raguel, uh, at least to date. Uh, but um, so... Uh, just doing the math here, uh, Abraham uh, at this point would be 137. Uh, so <laughs> these are these are children of his old age. But remember, part of the promise to him, we talked about in the promises to Abraham, that there was a promise regarding his seed, plural, right? That nations, plural, would come from him, right? And we see another group of nations here, right? Midian, the Midianites. And the Midianites and the Edomites and the Ishmaelites are all going to sort of coexist and intermingle, but they're all Abrahamites. And they're going to become important when we get into the, I'm, I'm teasing now, they're going to become important when we get to the life of Moses. Because when we get to the life of Moses, where we're going to go next, uh, starting uh, next month, uh, we're going to see that when when Israel is in Egypt, it's going to be these Midianites and the Edomites and the uh, Ishmaelites. They're going to be the ones who keep the worship of the true God going. They're going to be the ones who are worshiping Yahweh uh, in the land, carrying on Abraham's religion, worshiping the God of Abraham. Uh, while while uh, the descendants of uh, Israel, of Jacob, are, are in Egypt. But so here's another one of those nations. So th there are these two pieces. There's the many nations, and then th there's going to be one singular seed, right? Now that's going to be traced through Isaac, and then it's going to be traced through Jacob, and then it's going to be traced uh, through Judah. And ultimately, St. Paul tells us that that one seed is ultimately going to be Christ. Right, so we have this genealogy of Christ, right? Who's the ultimate fulfillment? Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of the promises to Abraham, but there's also this other piece that there are these sort of many nations, right? Who are who are going to uh, come from from Abraham? Verse five. Now Abraham gave all his possessions to Isaac, right? So there you have the other piece. There you have the singular piece. And, and this is common, right? So this is not like, wow, what a jerk. He loved his, his one kid more than all his other kids, right? Um, this is how things worked in, in the ancient world. Even up to, to the time of Christ, the firstborn son inherited everything. That's how it worked. It wasn't, it got split between the kids uh, or any of that kind of thing. You didn't leave a will saying who got what, right? Uh, when you when you pass away 
firstborn son gets everything. Uh, if you don't have a firstborn son, that's where where things become problematic, and it usually ends up going into your being merged into your brothers. If you have a brother, your brother's estate, then things can get even more complicated. But this is why we see in the Old Testament so much emphasis on having sons, right? And why the promise of Isaac to Abraham was so important. Remember, he didn't have any sons, and he thought he was going to have to make like his his chief servant, like his right hand man, make him his uh, heir because he didn't have a son. Uh, so this is why having a son becomes such a is such a big deal in the Old Testament. So this is the normal pattern. It's just Isaac is the one who has that firstborn status. So he inherits everything. And then it would be expected, usually, uh, but not required, just expected. It would be good form for the firstborn son to then sort of distribute things to the other children. Right? But he didn't, there's nothing that made him do that. He could keep it all if he wanted to. And there's a point where um, I believe it's in St. Matthew's gospel where someone comes to, to Jesus and says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Meaning his brother, his older brother had inherited everything and was not sharing, right? And so, you know, he comes to Jesus and says, hey, that's not fair. He should share it with me. Tell him to do it. And was probably disappointed because Jesus told him, you shouldn't be worried about that. Come follow me and be my disciple and don't don't worry about the money. Um, but so yeah, that that's how that worked. And this is this is what St. Paul will later uh, play on when he talks about Christ in terms of being the firstborn. Some people get really hung up on that. They say, like, oh, does that mean Christ didn't eternally exist? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that firstborn status, right? So like Jacob and Esau, Jacob technically was not the first one born, but he had the firstborn status. Judah was not the first son born. He had the first, got the firstborn status, right? So it's a status. And so St. Paul is going to say Christ has this firstborn status. So as we said, Christ is the end of all the promises uh, to, to Abraham. Christ receives all the promises and then distributes them to us, right? Distributes them to us. So we receive all of the promises and blessings of God through Christ in that sense. And this is why sometimes you'll see like in Hebrews, um, the language of us being Christ's brothers. And you're like, that's a little odd, right? But that's that's based on this. The idea is that he's the firstborn. He has the firstborn status, and then he distributes the good gifts to us, right? Out of his out of his goodness. Okay. So now Abraham gave all his possessions to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward away from Isaac his son to the country of the east. Okay, so um, he doesn't want Isaac to have trouble, right? And so, um, because, you know, even today, sometimes when someone passes away, the children get in fights about the estate, right? So he didn't want that to happen with Isaac. Uh, and so before he dies, he gives gifts, money, et cetera, et cetera to his other sons who he just saw named and sends them, says, you go over here, take, here you go, blessings, right? Sort of sends them on their way before he dies so that when he dies, there won't be any fighting and trouble sort of over the estate and, and Isaac can just inherit uh, in peace and continue. Verse 7, after these things, the sum of years Abraham lived were 175 years. So that does not mean that he lived another 175 years after that, right? Again, after these things just means time gap. And now we're at Abraham's death, and it's at the age of 175. 
Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, old and full of days, and was added to his people. So uh, Abraham breathes his last and died, right? Why is that breathed his last so important? Well, remember what made, we were just talking about how the way the book of Genesis sees a human being is that we are our body, but that our body is made alive by our soul, by our spirit. How is that reflected, right? Well, that's breathed into us by God, right? And so Abraham breathes his last breath in his life, right? Leaves his body. And notice, though, what it says happened to him. Um he is added to his people. Right? This goes back to that idea of him referring to Sarah as my dead. Right? What, what people is this referring to? Right? This isn't Sumerians, right? He went to the Sumerian section of Sheol or Hades or whatever. Right. So this is talking about that when 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 uh, Abraham dies, what the ancient Near Eastern person would have expected is that, well, he dies and he goes down to Sheol, right? And Sheol was not pleasant. Sheol is kind of like a slasher movie, right? It's full of demons, it's full of horror and darkness. Um, and uh, that's sort of your horrible existence for eternity after you die. This is saying that Abraham, for Abraham, something different than that happens, right? Something different than that happens. And that he's not the only one that that different thing happens to, right? Sarah was one of them. But there have also been people who we've read about before right? Whether we're talking about Seth, whether we're talking about, well, Enoch goes, goes sort of straight to heaven, do not pass go. Um, but uh, there have been other people to whom Abraham is joined. And this is where the concept, right? When Christ tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and he talks about Abraham's bosom and sort of being this part of, of Hades, right? that there is this area of Hades or Sheol, there is this other sort of fate where these people, where the fathers are. And Abraham becomes sort of emblematic of that because of texts like this right here, right? So Abraham is sort of the, the constituent. He's sort of our exhibit A of the type of person who is there, right? The person who in their life has drawn close to God, become like God, followed God, and now in their death, they aren't just sort of abandoned to the grave, to Sheol, to Hades, but are in this sort of other state. And out of that is going to develop what we celebrate on Holy Saturday, the idea of the harrowing of hell, the idea that Christ uh, dies so that he can go into Hades and uh, retrieve um, the fathers, right, who are there, including Abraham, right, and bring them, uh, bring them to paradise. Um, so in the last note here, so his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, opposite Mamre, in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zohar the Hittite, the field and the cave Abraham purchased from the sons of Het where they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. Thus it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at the well of the vision. Right. So notice here, um, Ishmael isn't sent away like the others. Ishmael and Isaac clearly have a positive relationship uh, at this point. Um, and work together to uh, to bury um, to bury Abraham. So that is the end of uh, the life of Abraham. Like I said, uh, next time we'll uh, 
get started at the beginning of Exodus, the life of Moses. That's a little shorter than we usually run. Uh, so I was actually correct in a prediction for once. That's rare. But uh, if people have questions about Abraham or anything else, if I if I totally don't know, I'm at my computer so I can Google it. So I had a question about numbers in the Bible, not the book of the Bible, but numbers yeah. in general. <laughs> um, yeah. So I know like in, in a lot of places, numbers can be used kind of symbolically. How do you how do you kind of figure out the balance between where numbers are being used symbolically and where they're being used more literally? Yeah. Well, that, that gets especially tricky when you're working with uh, the old Testament. Um, because for example, if um, someone was following along in something other than the Orthodox study Bible, uh, like all the number, the ages and stuff that I gave tonight at which people mm -hmm. died are going to be different in their Bibles, <laughs> right? Right. Um, because um, that's one of the things when you go from Hebrew to Greek that, that kind of gets flummoxed. And here's why. They didn't have numerals. Uh, the reason we call the numerals we use Arabic numerals is that they're Arabic numerals, <laughs> right? So the Arabic language didn't exist yet. Um, so when you record in a number in Hebrew, you use letters of the alphabet, right, to do the number. And that creates, there are literally places in the Old Testament where we're not sure the letters they use to do a number form a word. And so we're not sure if it's supposed to be the word or a number. Okay. Right? Um and so when it came to translating it into Greek, <laughs> right, there's a lot of easy room for slippage there, right? That's why numerals were invented, because they're a much more precise and clear way to do it, right? Okay. Um, so um, that said, I, th I think the key, if you're going to make the argument that numbers are there for symbolic purpose, right um you've kind of gotta crack the code i'll give an example i'll give an example um well first i'll use an extra biblical example that'll lead into my biblical example so the extra biblical example is um there's what's called the sumerian uh king's list um and uh um Yes, Michael. Um, so there's, there's a thing called the Sumerian Kings List that uh, has the all the kings, the Sumerian kings, going back before the flood, after the flood, and they have these sort of insanely long lifespans. Like people talk about the genealogies in the in Genesis, where people live like you know Adam lived 950 years and and whatever. Mm -hmm. This is like hundreds of thousands of years, right? Some of these people supposedly live, right? And so everyone thought this was just bizarro, but once they figured out uh, that Babylonian mathematics is all in base 60, I won't go too math nerdy on that, but uh, Babylonian mathematics is all in base 60. The holdover of that is that we have 60 second minutes and 60 minute hours. Um, that's one place where it still exists. But once they figured that out, they literally sort of cracked the code on those numbers and found patterns based on Babylonian mathematics that weren't apparent in our math, modern mathematics, right? And based on those patterns said, oh, it's trying to communicate X, Y, Z, right? So to me, that's a good case to take those numbers symbolically in that text. Right, because they seem to not communicate much of anything without that. And then with that, now they're communicative. Right. So that makes a very strong case. Right. 
So based on that, uh, scholars have been trying for a long time now to try to work with the genealogy, genealogies in Genesis in the same way. To say, are these big numbers for ages, are, is there some kind of symbolic or mathematical pattern there? And nobody's really pulled it off yet. But there's one piece we're relatively confident about on that. Um, and that is that uh, Enoch, in the genealogy of Seth, um, is uh, said to have lived 365 years. And Enoch, as we know from uh, St. Jude's epistle, if nowhere else, is the seventh from Adam. If you go to the Sumerian kings list and you go to the seventh person on the list, the seventh person on the list is said to have created the solar calendar. He's the one who invented the solar calendar with a 365 day year, right? So there seems to be some kind of connection there, right? And if you, if you look at the book of Enoch, like a huge chunk of the book of Enoch is all about the calendar, mm -hmm. right? So there seems to be some kind of connection there. There seems to be some way that at least that Enoch part of it is sort of riffing off or correcting or inverting something that's going on in the pagan literature of the time still not totally clear even there but we could find something tomorrow right translating tablets and all of a sudden it could all click right <laughs> like oh right um so i th i think the examples that are maybe a negative example would help the examples i find much less convincing are when uh, someone says, okay, well, this number is this. And then they just sort of start speculating off of that number. Right? Well, this number represents completeness or this number represents, or you know what I mean? Right? Mm -hmm. Where they say, I think this is a symbolic number and then sort of use that as a launching point. Rather than saying, I think this is a symbolic number and that explains what it's doing here. Right. And one good tell for that is that you have a number that doesn't need to be there. So an example of that would be the 153 fish they catch when the apostles go fishing during the resurrection periods. Right, there's no reason to list the exact number of fish, right? Yeah. There are similar stories where they don't list the exact number of fish. Where they have a miraculous case of it, it doesn't list the exact number. So that's a number that doesn't need to be there. So that means that number probably has some kind of symbolic significance. And you're not just sort of speculating out of your hat, <laughs> right? When you when you delve deeper into that. Okay. So there's not a there's not an easy like cookie cutter. Makes sense. Yeah. That's that's why that's why scholarship is all arguments. It's all people arguing back and forth, right? You have an idea, you write up the idea, everybody else tears it apart, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and then you try and reinforce it, gets teared apart again, right? And then hopefully somewhere down the line, you arrive at something pretty solid, you know? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Um... Uh, speaking of numbers, uh, I was ho hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, one uh, thing that I've heard, but not, not quite understood, is that th there's, I think there's just some prohibition of living over 120 years, and and you know, you, um, and then of course Sarah lived to be 127 years. I mean, for for one thing, I I, uh, I believe that comes out of Genesis six or so. Um, how, how are we to understand that? Yeah, so there, there's a question of how to read that verse in Genesis 6, right? Right. So um, here, I'll flip to it. <laughs> okay. So um, 
That is in Genesis 6, verse 3. And uh, if you want to hear me talk about the rest of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you can listen to the Lord of Spirits episode about giants and hear, hear me talk for hours and hours about that part. Okay. But uh, for this part, <laughs> verse 3, um, it's, uh, Then the Lord God said, My spirit shall not remain with these people forever, for they are flesh, so their days shall be 120 years. So this is said before the flood. God says this in response to how wicked the world has become. It says there in Genesis 6 that the world has become so wicked that man's every thought humanity has is always evil all the time, which is pretty bad, right? Because even I'm not that bad. I occasionally have a thought that isn't evil all the time. Occasionally, right? But <laughs> it's, um, so the other way to read, you could read this as, this is God saying, hey, those, those guys in that genealogy a um, couple chapters back, the problem is they were living too long, and that's how they became so evil. And therefore, I'm going to limit the age of humanity to 120, so they won't be able to get up to as many shenanigans, right? Um, I'm dubious of that reading for a couple of reasons. Um, the longer-lived people in the genealogies are actually the good people right? Not the opposite. And part of the problem of the evil is violence, right? And, and murder, like we see with Lamech in Cain's genealogy. So people's lives are getting cut short a lot, right? So it doesn't seem to me that the text sets up lifespan as the problem. So the other way to read this is that God is going to send the flood in 120 years, He's saying, I'm not going to deal with humanity forever. I'm going to put an end to this. I'm going to put an end to the evil, all this evil that's going on by sending the flood 120 years from now. And that actually kind of matches up with then the story of how the flood goes. Because remember, Noah spends 100 years building the ark, and then he, he gathers the animals, right? And so after 120 years from that point, right? God puts an end to humanity, except for Noah and his family. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Derek. I guess just uh, quickly, you could probably give me the answer. Is there any reading on why these people would want to call Abraham, you know, you are a king from God among us. Is there any extra like literature that would have any of the stories of this time or anything that you found that even points for a reason for that besides them just being um, like, you're awesome? I mean, you just, you just have to read about sort of divine kingship, the role that sort of kings played, right? Because um, that's what they're, they're comparing him to like one of the kings who are sort of God kings and priest kings. Right. Um, so it would be a comparison to like the, the Sumerian Lugal, right? To um, if you want to, if you want to read a, uh, a book on Sumerian religion in general, I'll recommend that. Uh, there's a book called The Treasures of Darkness. Ominous, I know, but Sumerian religion is kind of ominous. Um, that's all about the uh, religion of ancient Sumer and talks about the role of the king and that kind of a bunch of other stuff. That might be a good place to, to start because that's, that's the culture that uh, Abraham comes out of. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any immediate questions and hearing my dogs going crazy. It's okay with everybody. We'll wrap it up for tonight. This was sort of an epilogue Bible study to uh, um, to uh, the life of Abraham. And so next time we'll be uh, doing an introduction to uh, the life of Moses next month, which means uh, we'll start out with all about Egypt. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, at this point in history. 
only a small amount of discussing what point in history this is. So this is a whole thing. People write books and make documentaries and fight about when the Exodus happened historically. That bores me to tears, but we're going to get some broad stroke stuff. We're not, we're not going to get into the minutia of it. Um, but some stuff about Egypt, some stuff about Moses, and then we'll get into uh, Moses' life from there. Uh, so uh, until then, thank you, everybody.